Yoni Kaminski. 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 What names is worse than Schwarzenegger? Shalom. Stamps, Schwarzenegger, and the northern town of Miron on this week's program. 22 seconds and we'll be starting. Shalom and welcome to Israeli Salad. It takes a lot of time to go through a stamp expo. So many different artifacts to fit into a relatively small area. So until you come and visit a stamp exhibition in Israel, here's a look at the annual Tel Abul fair that I visited. You see here the stamp, first, pictures of the first, st proofs of the first stamps of Israel, and they were debating whether to call the country Yisrael or Yehuda, so they made them both ways, Yehuda and Yisrael, and in the end they came out with the stamps without any name on it at all. It just says Doar Ivri. I visited the Tel Abul 2004 stamp fair, which was organized by the Israel Philatelic Federation. This fair presented stamps from different countries and different periods in time. Here you have the first stamp that ever came out on cover from Great Britain in 1840. 1840. Next to it, you have the first stamps that came out from Israel in 1948 on first day cover. Next to this, you have the first U.S. stamp that came out in 1847, picturing Benjamin Franklin. Well, this is, this is a real history. Well, the stamps used to be the connection before television and internet. That's is how people were connected from one place to another. For me, it's very exciting because my husband is a stamp collector and I just sort of come along today and I find it fascinating. And you realize how much propaganda there can be in stamps. Any subject that uh, you can think about is, is shown on stamp. And uh, when we talk to teachers and and show it and to use it as an educational uh, uh, a system in the educational area. So that on any subject you want to teach, you want to show there are stamps. Stamps teach a lot about the history of their country of origin. And so the Israeli stamp fair was an opportunity to remember some of the different points in time of Israel's history. This is the oldest letter here. It was sent from Israel in 1471. What's interesting is that there's a threat against the messenger. If this letter gets lost, the messenger will be hanged. The topic of the Holocaust is perpetuated in many countries, especially in Europe. Almost each year there are new stamps published in memory of the ghettos, camps and the victims of the Holocaust. Here's a letter from Auschwitz. The censor erased complete sentences. It was forbidden then to send a letter by a Jew without adding the name Yisrael or Sarah to the first name. In order to send mail from Israel to any Arab country, they used to send the letter inside another envelope to England. And then, at the English Postal Authority, they knew to take off the first envelope and send the letter to Iraq or any other destination. I was very taken with uh, Ilan Roman now. They've got a stamp of our first Israeli astronaut, and that's come out now. And I'm very, very attached to his life story. Columbia Challenger was a great uh, historic feat for us. We were all saddened to see that it crashed. And all of our countries immediately decided we wanted to do something to perpetuate the names of all the Challenger uh, astronauts who were killed. Because it's, it, we had people from all around the world. At the fair, judges examined the collections that were brought by collectors and selected the winning collection and they are judged on the base of the quality of the material, the, the type of the subject that they are showing, the type of uh, how they present it, and they get the medal for it. There are three components to what is called a maximum card. It must have a stamp on a postcard, both relating to the same issue, and there must be a cancellation stamp. One of the main attractions of the fair was the Design a Stamp project. Children and adults had their works of art transformed into usable stamps. 
I got here a stamp that my granddaughter, she's two years old, and she made this painting for me just for this exhibit. I have uh, some uh, grandchildren, and I have to prepare, they are preparing to bar mitzvah. I want to send them a present with a drawing of, the, of a subject they are doing. On a stamp, yes. I'm drawing a stamp with the Leaning Tower of Pisa. They'll make it into a real stamp. And now, to understand the stamp collecting mania, here's a short story. There was a man who had a stamp, and there was, apparently there were only two of these stamps in the whole world. And, and he, the, one came, the other one came up for auction, and uh, he bought it. He bought it for mil, just over a million pounds. And as soon as he bought it, in this auction, he took it and he tore it up. So I said, what did you tear it up for? Such a valuable thing. He said, but now I've got the only one. <laughs> and it's worth a lot, lot more. <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger asked the Simon Wiesenthal Center to look into his father's involvement with the Nazi party during World War II. Schwarzenegger, who has enjoyed a close relationship with the Jewish community in Israel, found out some painful facts about his father. This may be one of the reasons the world-famous actor turned politician came to Israel for the groundbreaking ceremonies of a museum that will focus on issues of human dignity, responsibility, unity, and respect between people of all faiths. Mark Kaplan was there. California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger came to Israel for his first trip abroad as the governor of the Golden State. Governor Schwarzenegger who has been a longtime friend of Israel, attended contract signings for joint ventures between some Israeli and California companies. Uh, we had the very, very fortunate opportunity of spending several minutes in a private session with the governor of California. Uh, this relates to the fact that our company recently completed an agreement with the company here in Yoknam, Israel, called Arad Technologies. This governor, one as you heard today, has a very special personal commitment to Israel. And I think it is his goal to stimulate and create as much business as possible between certainly the state of California and Israel and really the entire U.S. as, as a country. The next major issue that this governor plans to address is that of energy conservation and technology such as ours that can help eliminate uh, blackouts, brownouts by reducing this uh, critical demand. The purpose of Schwarzenegger's trip to Israel was the groundbreaking ceremony for the Simon Wiesenthal Center's Museum of Tolerance in Jerusalem. The show's all-star cast included most of the government's ministers as well as President Katsav. I first met uh, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger when he wasn't a governor. It was on a visit to uh, the Simon Wiesenthal Museum in Los Angeles. So I got a double whammy. I got to spend a very powerful afternoon with Rabbi Heyer and with the future governor. And I was impressed with their dedication, their openness, their warmth, their courage. So it's very good to see both of you here in this groundbreaking event. The museum was designed by world-renowned architect Frank Gehry. And looking out at the people of Jerusalem and thinking how brave they are, some of the bravest people on earth, I believe. And I sometimes dreamed that one day I would, when I became an architect, I would be allowed to build something here, and it seems that dream is coming true. <laughs> here at a crucial moment in the history when terrorism, antisemitism, and bigotry again dominate our world, we have come together to build the Center for Human Dignity, the Museum of Tolerance, Jerusalem. But it was no surprise that the highlight of the ceremony was a speech by Governor Schwarzenegger. This building will be a candle to guide us. No other nation in the Middle East is declaring so clearly and so visibly that the future can be a place of tolerance and mutual respect. I was born in Austria, a country that is beautiful and I love it, but a place where intolerance and ignorance led to atrocities and heartache. Because of that, 
I want to do whatever I can to promote tolerance around the world. Reporting from Independence Park in Jerusalem, this is Mark Kaplan for Israeli Salad. I'm um, Yisrael Chai. You are watching Israel National News TV. The festival of Lagba Omer takes place after Shabbat. One of the places that is visited by many on Lagba Omer is the northern town of Meron. Shlomo Blas and I visited Meron and witnessed the preparations for Lagba Omer. On the Galilean mountain of Meron, west to the northern city of Tzfat, lies the tomb of the sage Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, also known as the Rashbi. Lagba Omer, the 33rd day counted after the Passover holiday, marks the passing of the Rashbi approximately 1800 years ago. Each year, multitudes of believers come to the site to mark this day. It says that when a righteous man passes away, there is joy in heaven which can also influence us. And we are happy and full of gratitude for the heritage this sage left us and for seeing that the people of Israel live on. The Rajbi, who escaped persecutions by the Romans and lived in a cave on this mountain, wrote the Zohar, which contains the main principles and teachings of the inner truth of the Torah. These were passed throughout Jewish history by the great Torah scholars policemen are prepared for the coming of an expected 450,000 visitors. Many families moved out of their homes and settled as close as possible to the holy site. For some of these pilgrims, this has become a family tradition. My father comes every year since he came to Israel 54 years ago. We come here every year from Israel's day of the independence until after Lagba Omer. It comes out to about two to three weeks every year. The residents of this tent neighborhood can relax while the latecomers, arriving only one day early, struggle through traffic. Many organizations provide food and drink for the guests and the merchants are prepared with their goods, books, pictures and blessed olive oil. The highlight of the event will be when all celebrators gathered from different sectors and places will mark this holy day in accordance with their tradition. The night is the night. You must see it for yourself. It can't be described. It's like a trance. We are all looking forward for this night. Dancing, singing, bonfires, a lot of whiskey. Outside it is like the celebration of Simchat Torah. And inside it is like the awe of the Day of Atonement. Dancing in one place and tears in the other, each one gives a share for the redemption of Israel. Coming to this site on this day, one can receive in addition to warm hospitality and a free meal, a handful of blessings. So what's the meaning of the traditions of Lagba Omer? We are now joined on the phone by Rabbi David Sampson. Shalom Rabbi Sampson. Shalom Yoni, shalom to all of our viewers. Last week we talked about the Independence Day barbecue. It seems that us Jews like to cook out. <laughs> on the festival of Lagba Omer, it is custom to have a bonfire. What's the meaning of this tradition? Well, I wish I could give you a very clear answer that uh, it originated and the reason is for the truth is, nobody really knows. And it's a custom that has just been blown out of proportions, and that even though there are a few allusions, some of them to the Bar Kokhba rebellion that uh, was uh, instigated by Rabbi Akiva and the students of Rabbi Akiva that ceased uh, the... It says that on Lagba Omer they stopped dying, and that it could be that it's a, a memory of the Bar Kokhba rebellion. And of course... Lag Bomir is the day when the great rabbi, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, 
uh, passed away, and we light a candle in memory. But, you know, to really go all out with bonfires, there really is no reason. There's an interesting thing that's brought down in the response to literature of Rabbi Chaim Sofer about 200 years ago, and he said that the reason for the earthquake in Tzfat and his time was because people celebrated Lagba Omer with such fervor, and they all went to the grave of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and they turned Tzfat into the main place of worship, and Jerusalem was secondary. And uh, God wanted to make it clear that in the redemptive period, Jerusalem was to be number one, and Tzfat was supposed to take a secondary role. And in order to do that, he had to actually make an earthquake in Tzfat to make the point clear. So how should things be put back into proportions? How should we celebrate Lag Baomer? Well, the truth is that now I think Jerusalem has already achieved its role as being number one, and it's the capital of Israel and the capital of uh, Torah study, and that I think there's no problem uh, today going to Tzfat and to Meiron and to celebrating uh, Lag Omer by going to the grave of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and lighting bonfires, singing songs, and that as long as the gist of it is uh, something positive and bringing you to a heightened cleaving with God, it's all good. Thank you very much, Rabbi Samson. It's been a pleasure. The Weekly Insight is brought to you in cooperation with Mahon Meir, the largest Zionist institute in Israel, bringing people closer to Judaism. That's all for this week. Join us again next week for another program. Email away. We'd love to hear from all of you. So until next time, from all of us here at Israel National TV, Shalom. Shalom.